uh, creationism and evolution. They're both religions, both take faith to believe in them, both have their documents, both have their leaders and everything. And then right here we talk about the earth's age. And again, there's two opinions. One opinion is that the earth is uh, very young, no more than probably six, eight, ten thousand years. And the other one is the earth is very, very old in the billions now, in fact. And then, of course, it's also two philosophies. Uh, creation and evolution are two philosophies because they're thought process. Uh, you... Um, you have to believe in them. It's, it's, a, it's a way of thinking is what it actually is. And uh, so we've been talking about that and we'll continue to. And then the global flood, is it uh, myth or truth? And last week uh, we attempted to give uh, a whole bunch of evidence for the fact that there has been a global flood. It, it, even the evolutionists uh, agree that it looks as if the ocean has covered every continent at one time or another. And uh, so the creationists believe it did it all at one time, and they believe it happened over hundreds of millions of years in different places at different times. But you find seashells on the tallest mountains. And then today where we're at is dinosaurs. Dinosaurs and man, they coexist or not. So that's where we're headed today. And in the future, we'll talk about the Ice Age. Was it ancient or of recent origin? How about evil? Where does bad things come from? Did evil evolve, or is evil a sin, the result of, you know, sin? It's, it's two philosophies, two religions, two opinions, two thought processes. Race, very interesting topic. Where did race come from? Did, did, did we evolve into different races? If we did, we're still evolving, and we'll evolve farther. If we did not evolve into race, then what is race? It doesn't exist. And so that's a big one to swallow right there. And uh, so it deals with our being, um, uh, what do they call it, politically correct nowadays or something like that. And then down here, the National Academy of Sciences, that one book that uh, Ray said was second choice, is a scientist answer to a pamphlet put out by the National Academy of Sciences. Now, the National Academy of Sciences, very prestigious organization, a very honest organization until recently, in the last uh, 20, 30, 40 years. And now they have an agenda because they've been permeated with uh, evolutionary scientists. And uh, they're very dishonest now. They have a total agenda, and their agenda is evolution. And they put this a pamphlet out and sent it to every teacher in the United States that they had a name for, could find a place to send it. It should be in all the libraries and everything on how to teach the young people evolution because they were being denied the truth in the public school system. And that's the prestigious National Academy of Sciences. And so that second book that Ray had there, uh, that book uh, was an answer to that pamphlet. And it has some very good information in it about the many frauds that's been uh, just plain old, per, you know, perpetuated by different men uh, to, for honor, for glory, for prestige, for money, for gain, and also for the fact they hate God. You know, there's different agendas. Well, that's where we've been headed to and where we're going. And remember, this thing, is evolution is supposed to be scientific, and if you'll recall, we stated that uh, you cannot observe evolution, you cannot propose, well, you could propose some ideals about it, but you can't propose how to do an experiment to gather data in anything that's evolution. You can formulate a theory, but it would be based on your imagination, which is philosophy. And uh, so you could actually, you can't repeat it. All you can repeat is your thought process. You can't repeat any experiment because you have no experiment. And so all you can do is formulate a theory from your belief system, your philosophical thought process, your religion, and you can keep repeating your thought process, but it'll never become a law, never become a law. At best, it's a philosophical thought process. And uh, then uh, what we did in looking at our uh, information, we talked about right here a comparison uh, coming from the unknown 
you know, unknown uh, source of getting from nothing to something. And to get through a chaotic system from the non-living to the living. And then to go from the very simple one cell like amoeba to the complex of, of kinds of uh, plants and animals we have today. And they did it by survival of the fittest, their competitors. And the biggest competitors now, according to the evolutionary thought process, is man and the insects. And they say the insects will win. But nobody's going to win in evolution because our future is the death of our sun. Our star, our sun will dim and life will cease to exist as we know it. There'll be no life processes at all on what we call earth. That's evolution. And you see there's no God involved here at all. No designer, no pattern maker, no master thinker or anything. Over here you still uh, go from nothing to something, but it's a known process by a creator God, and the God created it said it's very good. It's not chaotic. It was very good. And that also, they up here where they had to organize and from no living to the living and keep getting more and more complex, God created it organized in specific kinds. And it's interesting to note that if you look at the plants and animals today, on earth, they're still separated into kinds, just like God said so in the book of Genesis. There's never been found an intermediary between any kinds at all. And of course, survival of the fittest as results of being redeemed. You know, we go simple to complex here. God made us uh, complex but simple, but he made us, you know, basically in perfection, but he allowed man a choice and man sin, but God redeemed us out of love, whereas over here, it's survival of the fittest. It's dog eat dog. It's who can uh, rise to the top of the heap and dominate the heap. But to what's the future? You see the future is competition here between man and insects. Inevitably death. And here the future we have is harmony. God's going to show us how it could have been. In the millennium he's going to give us a thousand years to show us everything back in balance again. Before he ushers us into eternity. Whereas here... We have no future. But uh, this, remember, is a religion. This is a belief system. That is a philosophy. This is a religion. This is a belief system. This is a philosophy. We call this one, we call it Christianity. And then, of course, we also talked, how old is the earth? And we offered many, many things. We first said, nobody's sure. The evolutionists are not sure. The creationists are not sure. But looking at the evidence, and this still doesn't give us a date, it would appear the Earth's about seven to 35,000 years old, somewhere in that vicinity. More likely closer to 6,000. But if you look at, it's impossible to be millions or billions because of all those reasons we gave you about the magnetic field and the iron content, nickel content, uh, helium flux from the earth and content in the atmosphere and uh, meteoric dust depths on the moon and earth and all that kind of thing and stalactite formation carbon dating all those things actually point to an earth that is younger than 35,000 years at the very most use an evolutionary thought process that's a creation thought process as the earth is about six to seven thousand years old but even using science, pure science, true science, starting the top of the list and going down the list in the process rather than starting in the middle with your uh, thought process already made up, in other words, your opinion already fixed, now you're just looking to manipulate evidence to prove your theory. That's the evolutionary method. Well, here we compared evolution and creation, some arguments for it and things like that, and survival of the fittest, and here love your fellow man and man you know here is an animal and man here's the image of God and you can look no accountability accountability and go right on top of the list see vast amounts of time by random choice which violates the laws of nature if you want to call it that over here we call it violates the laws of God in other words when he created what he did in six days in a process with purpose and design it would appear that he violated the laws of physics. But after all, 
He's the creator and he did not establish the laws of physics until after he finished creating. And that's the reason why in the creation account it says at the end of each day it was good. It was good. It was good. He was still creating. Sixth day, he said it's very good. It's finished. That's it. And then uh, on that sixth day, of course, you remember he created E from Adam. He created uh, E from living cells taken from Adam. So God himself did not violate cell law when he made E. In other words, he started using his own law and set it. Now today, if you have a violation of a law of physics or chemistry or whatever, we call it a miracle. Uh, the evolutionists and all call it an anomaly. In other words, there's lots of anomalies around. And uh, there's anomalies walking around. And then, of course, we looked at evidence for a global flood. And uh, we noticed that there was uh, wave marks on the Sphinx and there's uh, wave marks on the mountains in New Guinea and uh, the continental shelves far out at sea where the oceans used to be a lot lower. And if you take the ocean down to the continental shelf, all land as we know it today would be connected together to be no isolated land. People and animals could have moved out to every part of the world as we know it, the earth. Uh, after the flood, after they were dispersed at the Tower of Babel when their language was confused. And they would have dispersed, but in the meantime, the ocean levels are getting higher and higher and higher because of the melting of the ice cap. And the ice cap was found, formed after the flood because uh, climatic conditions didn't start until after the flood. And that's recorded right in Genesis. You go read chapter 6, 7, 8 about the flood, and you'll see the last part of the flood account after Noah and the ark rest and all that kind of thing, uh, then it talks about God set the sun, moon, stars for seasons and all kinds of things. And for, you know, and he had the four seasons established, weather came along. He also said that man could eat animals and animals could eat animals. In fact, animals could eat man. In other words, become meat eaters after the flood. The weather changed. We got weather phenomena. Uh, we got the ice age. We had a a body found in ice between Italy and Austria called the uh, Ice Man. And uh, as we stated before, that two-hour program just talked, it was just like talking the flood stories, what it was like post-flood. And then when they realized where they're headed with that, they remade it, didn't put it out again for about two years, put it out two years later in a one-hour version, and it was evolution, evolution, evolution. They took all the evidence for a flood out of that story. And... Uh, so we looked at all that evidence for a flood, and it's not just that type of thing, but the evidence also is in written form. Uh, we're talking about these ancient stories of the Babylonian flood epic, which is a distortion story after the man got farther away from God. Uh, his truth gets distorted, and so actually it's become a myth, a Babylonian flood epic, but it's based on the real flood. The, the flood of Noah is not based upon the Babylonian flood epic. It's the other way around. And a Sumer, Sumerian, Sumerian deluge is another story that's in written form. And another one, it's the Deucalion flood, a Greek story. And then the t tale of Samothrace. It's an island in the Aegean Sea between uh, uh, Greece and Turkey. And this is the mouth of the Dardanelles, and the Dardanelles are those small openings where the water flows from the Mediterranean into the Black Sea. And then, of course, uh, we also looked at the telling of, uh, I guess that's at Rossus. He's a st storyteller near Aya, a scribe, in the Babylonian area, 1700 B.C., now that's getting right back there. And this is, uh, this is, uh, this story is recorded in an embroidery rug. In other words, it's, uh, they actually, it's like uh, recorded there, the whole story is. And in essence, it's a paraphrase of the biblical account of the flood. I mean, it just goes right down uh, Genesis 6, 7, and 8. And remember, that was done in, oh, goodness gracious, how long ago? 1700 B.C., now we're about 2000 B.C., 3700 years ago. And the recent findings on the flooding of the Mediterranean Basin were the resulting flooding of the uh, Black Sea area. We call it the Black Sea today, but it was actually a freshwater lake, and a river flowed into it, and the river flowed on to the uh, basin 
of the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean was a dry desert and it was below sea level because as the ice, uh, ice melted, the ocean levels came up, it finally got higher than this low-like pass that we now call the Straits of Gibraltar and the water poured from the Atlantic Ocean into the Mediterranean Basin and filled it up and we call it today the Mediterranean Sea and it filled up the Dardanelles and finally spilled over the gap uh, up in the Dardanelles that opened into this vast valley uh, which had this freshwater lake and we now call it the Black Sea and it's saltwater lake and if I had the time I could just talk for hours and hours about that there's a secular book out, and a secular book, Noah's Flood. And they're saying that this myth of the Noah's Flood came from the actually spillover of the Mediterranean into the Black Sea Basin and formed the Black Sea. And if you read this book and you've got all your other background information, all this book does is just talks all over the place, global flood, melting the ice cap, filling up the Mediterranean Basin, spilling over into the Black Sea, and uh, these are post-flood people and post-flood conditions. And this is recorded in history. At a, lot, a long time, a lot of these stories were ignored. You know, they, they didn't put any confidence in these ancient stories. What's amazing is they're now starting to put confidence in these stories like this. Well, it's documented. You know, people wrote about the filling of the Black Sea. You know, it, it's there. But they're still refusing to accept the information that's written in the ancient, not ancient, not too long back, 1500s, history books, science books, and the modern day evolutionists will not accept those stories. They just ignore them because they violate their, con their uh, thought process, see? And so uh, that's a very good book if you're already knowledgeable in creation science. But if you're not knowledgeable in creation science, this book's intent is to pull you away from the biblical story and make you believe it's a myth based upon these tremendous findings of these group of men, see, over in the Black Sea. And uh, so uh, we uh, also talked a little bit, just mentioned Grand Canyon last week. That's where we left off, basically. And the Grand Canyon, as you know, the Kebab Plateau is like this in Arizona, you know, sort of north to south, that type of thing, maybe at a little angle. And when the floodwaters went down, it trapped a vast lake behind that plateau. That lake covered most of Arizona and Utah and Nevada and New Mexico. And uh, that's, that's known. I mean, they, everybody looks around out there and they know that there was a gigantic lake there at one time. And all of a sudden, there's a canyon here. And they said, well, this canyon, probably four, five, six, seven hundred million years old, just very, very old because it would have taken the Colorado River that long to cut it. Well, no reputable scientist, even evolutionary scientist, believes that anymore, even though he sees, still sits in books. They all say, that's, that's, no, that's not the way. What they propose now is that the plateau was not a plateau and the Colorado River just flowed through like this. And this plateau kept climbing higher and higher and higher, you know, but up thrust, mountain building. And as it come up, the, the Colorado River would cut through it. Well, if I go out here somewhere and if I have an up thrust like a an upthrust, let me tell you what an upthrust is in modern day terms. It's a dam. We build a dam across the river. Does the river cut through the dam? No. If the water start backing up behind it, it'll grow and it'll back up. It'll spill over it, see? It'll back up or it'll come and curve around. It won't cut through it though. Well, this water they know wound up being almost a mile deep behind that plateau in this ancient sea. Then all of a sudden the water's all gone, it's mostly desert out there, and you got this gigantic canyon now cut through the Kebab Plateau. You know when you go to the Grand Canyon, you start down in the low desert, and you have to climb up onto the Mongolone Rim, and you get up, and uh, you're almost a mile higher than you were down at Phoenix, and you look down into the canyon. If you're coming from the northeast, you're floating the Colorado River, when you enter the Grand Canyon, you do not drop down into the canyon. You enter the canyon. It's on both sides of you. you know, it's like a mountain range here. And you come to it, and there's a hole cut right through this mountain. And you go into the Grand Canyon. You don't descend down into the Grand Canyon. You go into the Grand Canyon. And of course, because the water's flowing, that means it's losing elevation. 
we lose elevation here in Laurel County. Laurel County is pretty high and uh, you know water runs off the high places to low places. That's sort of a fact of life. It's called gravity and other things. Well the evidence is that that Kebab Plateau gave way very suddenly. In other words probably most likely what happened there was a leak through there and with that kind of pressure behind water you know you can cut stone, you can cut steel if you put enough pressure behind water. And uh, so that water pressure got into those cracks and started forcing its way through. When it, got a, when it got enough of an opening, it blew open. And very quickly in the matter, probably of no more than a weeks, months, no more, no, not even a year, less than a year, the Grand Canyon was made. The Grand Canyon gives evidence of fast erosion. There's a difference between slow erosion and fast erosion. You take a camera in a cornfield after rain, you know, the farmer's plowed his field, he's harrowed it all out, you know, and he's got all nice and smooth, and it's sort of on rolling little hills. Here comes one of them big gully washers like we've been getting around here lately. And you go out in the field and you'll see all these little erosions. You take a picture of that with your camera. Then you get up an airplane up over Grand Canyon. You'd have to get up pretty, pretty high to get the Grand Canyon in, 40, 50, 60,000 feet or so. And you take a picture of the Grand Canyon, you look at two pictures, and you're looking at the same thing. In other words, you're looking at the same kind of erosion. The erosion that erodes a cornfield after a fast gully washer is the same pattern as the pattern of the Grand Canyon. Slow erosions like this. It's a meandering river like this. Slow erosion. You know, the Mississippi goes like this, just all over the place. And it's got all these little bows that get cut off and wind up with a little lake over here, you know. It just moves all over the place slowly, back and forth. Not so with the Grand Canyon. Well, that was another one. And um, then um, we, uh, today, what about dinosaurs? Well, the thing about dinosaurs is they sell evolution. That's, that's, that's their big claim, you know. If you can uh, get people hooked on to dinosaurs, you'll have them talking in millions of years, extinction, separation of man and dinosaurs, and, and you'll just bring people right into that thought process. Uh, they sell evolution. They sell millions and billions of years, and they sell natural process without a designer. Without a pattern, without a pattern maker, without a creator, without a designer. And they were horrible, vicious things, right? And, uh, you know, they can take a, a piece of a bone, you make a whole dinosaur. The color, texture of its skin, the sound. What amazes me in these programs on the Discovery Channel and A&E and, and History Channel, they even tell us what kind of sounds they make. You know, at best, if, if you had a complete dinosaur skeleton, you only have 40% of the body. Only 40%. That's if you have a complete skeleton. They've never found a complete skeleton of a dinosaur. I don't know if you're aware of that or not. They find some that are pretty complete. And only recently did they find a Tyrannosaurus rex that was nearly complete. They still haven't figured out what them little arms are up here for. They make no sense at all, evolutionary-wise. None whatsoever. And those big teeth of the T-Rex, they claim they were meat-eating, you know, just slashing and cutting everybody to pieces. They were terrible lizards. That's what dinosaur means, is terrible lizard. Hey, if you looked at the teeth of a panda bear, if the panda was extinct and we had no living pandas today, do you know what evolutionary science would say when they found a skull of a panda with its teeth? He was a vicious meat-eater. He's got what looks like vicious, tearing, meat-eating teeth. You want a panda eats? Bamboo shoots. That's observable. Yet he's got all these beautiful teeth, you know, that just shred, just shred things up. How about a bat? If we had no bats today and you found a skeleton of a bat, with those teeth and things he's got, what would you propose about him? Why, you'd think he was a terrible, vicious thing, you know? And you know what they eat? Nectar of fruit. So you can't tell anything really about a skeleton. At most, if you have the complete skeleton, you only have 40% of the body, and it really doesn't tell you anything. Another thing, 
They're finding Tyrannosaurus rex skeletons now, and parts of its bones are not fossilized. In other words, they're not mineralized. If the Tyrannosaurus rex sliced one vanished 65 million years ago, how did that natural bone survive today with the remnants of red blood cells still in the bone? That's impossible. It's absolutely impossible for organic material to survive 65 million years. And that's when the last dinosaur was supposed to have vanished 65 million years ago. They're raised, they're gray claim to when they ruled the earth. They were the rulers of the earth like man is today. Dinosaurs used to rule between 145, uh, we'd say years, 145 million years ago or before Christ. They don't do it. They say before current era or in ancient time or whatever. But 145 million years ago to 65 million years ago is when the dinosaurs reigned. In other words, they evolved from uh, amphibians animals that could move in and out of the water. And then, then you got a prototype reptile that couldn't get back in the water and live anymore and you had to stay outside. And then those, that first reptile evolved into many different kind of reptiles, one of which was the dinosaur who rose to the top of the heap 145 million years ago and who fell to the bottom of the heap 65 million years ago and vanished. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. So that's the reason why that dinosaur is such a big deal today. They can capture children they can capture school uh, students. They can capture graduate students. They can capture just about anybody and everybody they want with dinosaurs. All these kids run around with little dinosaurs, carrying them everywhere. They know all their names. And you talk to your kids about them, and you, you hear, listen to what they tell you about them. They'll tell you when they lived. 300 million years ago, 100 million years ago, this or that, you know. And these kids know a lot of information about dinosaurs because they've been told that information. Well, how about um, creation? It sells Bible thought process. It sells thousands of years, and it sells a designer theory. So there's your two choices. There's your two philosophies. There's your two opinions that we've been talking about. Well, does the Bible really have anything at all to say about dinosaurs? Well, I thought I'd throw a few of the passages up there. Now, in the Bible, they call, uh, in, in our Bible, we mostly use English Bibles, the notorious, well-known English Bibles, the King James Version. When was the King James Version translated? 1611. Do you know when the word dinosaur was coined? 1822, I believe it was. The King James and translators couldn't put the word dinosaur in the Bible because it didn't exist until 1822. But the word that did exist that described what was being described in the Bible was dragon. Dragon. And I'll show you a moment where that came from. Well, here's the sea monsters. The word that's used for sea monster here basically is about the same word used for the sea monster that swallowed Noah. Jonah, not Noah. I always get those guys backwards. Sometimes I even say the words creation and evolution backwards. That gets people's attention. I did that. I looked at one of the tapes the other night. I came in on Sunday evening and watched the tape. And man, in one of those tapes, I'd turn evolution and creation around for a couple of sentences. That must have really blown everybody's mind. And the sixth day, all the land creatures came into being. That would include dinosaurs. The bee who moved right here in Job. Behemoth, there's, that's not an English word. Behemoth is a direct transliteration of a Hebrew word, behemoth, behemoth. And uh, that's like David, David, David. We pronounce it a little different. David is not an English word. David is a Hebrew word, David. And D-A-V-I-D is a direct transliteration of the Hebrew. Beth. Lehem. Beth. Word for house. Lehem. The word for bread. House of bread. Bethlehem. House of bread. See, if we really wanted to put Bethlehem into English, the King James interpreter should have said Jesus Christ, you know, was born in the house of bread. 
But they, you know, they probably thought, well, you know, Americans and Englishmen, they won't understand that. We better just use, we better transliterate this word and leave it Bethlehem. And how, what do they know to call David? I mean, David's his name. What else can they call him except David? There's no American word that translates Dawid and uh, whatever in English. It doesn't. It's, it's the name. Uh, you know, once you learn your biblical names and you learn transliteration of other languages, if you understand, you don't have to even understand the language. If you just understand that uh, like uh, uh, an A in English is a, a, a in Russian, you know, or it's, uh, it's comus in Hebrew or whatever, you know, it's alpha in Greek, you could actually take and transliterate that language and you'll find all the books of the Bible and you'll find the name of the prophets and the name of places and all kinds of things. And you don't have to even understand the language. Because if you just learn to transliterate, you can do that. Well, the behemoth is just a transliteration and they didn't know how to put it. The Leviathan and, uh, you know, behemoth and Leviathan, it's in Job. The be they're said to be the crocodile, the elephant, or the hippopotamus. Well, I want to tell you, that one it's describing, he says he has a tail that can move around like cedar trees. And do you ever see an elephant with a tail that looks big as cedar tree? Or a hippopotamus? He got little tiny tails, little flimsy things. Why we buy into that, I don't know. Why we buy into these things are crocodiles that leave a trail of shining stuff on the water when it goes by. Uh, there's not anything wrong with fire-breathing dragons. You know, God made some wonderful, wonderful things. You know, there's a, there's a fire-spitting beetle on earth right now. And he could out, spit out a fireball. They don't talk about him much, but he can do it. And dragons is in Psalms. Isaiah, slay the dragons. Isaiah 36, fiery flying serpent. Jeremiah 51, 34, he says... Uh, Jeremiah says that Nebuchadnezzar is going to swallow me like a dragon. Malachi 1.3, dragons are in the wilderness. In fact, this word dragon, which in the Hebrew is ton, ton, that's uh, T-A-N. That's tet pata nun see? Ton, and ton means dragon. 30 times in the Old Testament. Hebrew is so specific, they have tan, they have tanin, they have tanim, and tanat. And those four words, masculine singular, feminine singular, masculine plural, and feminine plural. You know if you're dealing with one or more male or female dragons. All Hebrews that way. Very descriptive, very descriptive. Still got those papers in between there because this ink I'm using smears. Dinosaur, the terrible lizard, coined in 1841 by Dr. Richard Owen, who incidentally, if you remember now, uh, Darwin was formulating his Darwinian theory at this time. This, he is a contemporary of Darwin, and he was an absolute anti-Darwinian. He said, this, this, this theory absolutely has no foundation whatsoever. And they started finding these bones and things back at about 1822. That's the first documented. I'm sure people found big bones before that. They just didn't bother with them. But somebody found one and actually got thinking about it. And so they finally got named uh, di uh, a dinosaur because it means terrible lizard. King James Version Translation 1611, the word dinosaur not yet invented. Ton translated dragon. Now, if we were just now doing a translation, uh, you know, a good open-minded Bible translator would probably translate the word ton, since we now have an English word for it, dinosaur. We'd probably translate it as dinosaur. But uh, that's who they're talking about. Well, again, we're right back here with the dinosaur talking about creation and evolution. Here's what's strange. The creation and evolutionists both have the same evidence. They have the same bones of the same dinosaurs. In other words, the evolutionists don't have a set of evolutionary bones, and the creationists have a set of evolutionary bones. 
They have the same bones, we live in the same universe, but we form two entirely different views, a Christian worldview and a secular worldview. And that's really another way of saying Christian worldview and secular worldview is to say what Paul was talking about when he talked about spiritual warfare. And that's basically what it is. This is spiritual warfare. But let's look at some history for a moment. Sumerian story, 2000 B.C. talked about dragons and about a hero that slew a dragon. Alexander the Great in 330 B.C. when he went into India, he and his troops found a place in India where they had this hissing, large, monstrous animal that they worshipped and they kept it in, in a cave. And the description of it fits the dinosaur. Uh, here in China, many, many dragons in China. You don't have to go anywhere in China to see pictures of dragons and mock-ups of dragons and all that. Stories, pottery, embroidery, documentation. In fact, some of the greatest dinosaur beds right now are being found in the Gobi Desert. Even fossilized dinosaur eggs with fossilized fetus in them. Now that's what blows your mind. You know, how in the world did these eggs lay around for millions of years get fossilized with the fetus getting fossilized inside the egg. You know. And it's just amazing. The fossils are not rare. Even dinosaur fossils are not rare. They're, when they find a fossil bed of dinosaurs, they're just stacked on one another. And they show that they've been sorted by size, shape, and weight. Fossils show that. Well, down here in England, St. George is said to kill a dragon. That's a story that's in history. 10th century, there was a written account about a meeting with a dragon. And this thing here was a stegosaurus from the uh, description it was given. You could today put this dinosaur name on it. And in the 1500s, there was an European science book on histories of animals. And dragons were listed as still living in the 1400s. In May 13, 1572, near Bologna, Bologna, Italy, a dragon was killed by a peasant by the name of Baptista, and the description fits the, uh, the tena, I guess, tenostrophius. In other words, there's, there's all kinds of written accounts of these things, and uh, the evolutionists refuse to consider this because they say, what they say is, these, this is not science. In other words, Something that's written in a history by a naturalist, an educated man of the time, is not acceptable to them. Their imagination today is acceptable, but written accounts are not acceptable. Well, not only do they refuse to accept that, they even refuse to accept this. They uh, can't explain it, but they refuse to accept it. Petroglyphus carved uh, drawings in stone. This one's in White River Canyon in Utah, right here in the United States. This is carved inside the wall and the wall in the canyon. And this is an ancient Indian rock drawing. And it's a sauropod dinosaur. Now you tell me how American Indians knew how to draw a picture of something that vanished 65 million years ago. And these Indians drew this before Columbus came here. In other words, nobody, in fact, we didn't even start classifying dinosaurs, even looking for them until after 1822, after the first bones were found, and they were named in 1841, and then everybody got turned on to them about the last part of the 19th century. And uh, so how in the world, do you, and also there's another drawing, and I forget exactly where it's at, but it's of a Tyrannosaurus rex, drawn on a cave wall. And uh, so they, they don't know how this happened, so they just ignore it because it doesn't fit the theory. Well, the big problem with dinosaurs, if they were so powerful and they dominated, what happened to them? And I want to tell you, this is one of the ones they've really worked hard on. If you look here, the mysterious disappearance of dinosaurs. They starved to death. They ate themselves to death. They were poisoned. Uh, they become blind, therefore they couldn't find mates, so they couldn't mate with one another. Their eggs were destroyed by mammals who were coming on the scene, and the mammals ate all their eggs. Volcanic dust killed them out. Poisonous gas killed them. Comets, and uh, sometimes I have trouble seeing that. 
sunspots, meter rats, mass suicide, parasites, shrinking brain. Now there's one for your evolutionary theory, shrinking brain. The brain starts shrinking over time, they become too stupid to survive. That's sort of strange evolution. And, uh, and changes in the atmospheric gases and etc. and etc. and etc. You would not believe. And yet there's one nice theory that says what happened to them. And of course uh, they went into extinction. And why uh, do animals go into extinction? You know, we have to admit, evolutionists, creationists like have to admit they're extinct, possibly. There may be some rare ones around. But why do animals become extinct? Competition for food. Other catastrophes besides drought and not having sufficient food. Kill the man either for food or fun or profit. Now this profit here also could be for food, in order to live. And, um, or destruction of habitat. Now if you look on here, you'll see the basis for a lot of environmentalists right here. Destruction of habitat, killing of animals for fun or profit, uh, you know, competition for food, setting aside uh, protective reserves and uh, trying to manipulate evolution. That's what gets me is they believe in evolution and yet they try to manipulate it. And they're trying to protect, according to their theory, it's survival of the fittest, but they're trying to protect the weak ones. Now what kind of future is there for evolution if they keep protecting the weak? We should leave it alone. If you really believe in evolution, you should leave it alone let the fittest survive. And uh, I bet we won't, I bet even the evolutionist doesn't let the cockroaches live in his kitchen. <laughs> and yet he believes that the insects are going to win. If he believes the insects are going to win, he really believes in his theory, he should leave the cockroaches alone. And the ants, and the hornets, and the killer bees. Just natural phenomena. Killer bees come up north and kill us all as humans out. Big deal, so what? It's evolution, survival of the fittest. That's what it's all about, see? And, um, if, if you really believe in evolution, we should be seeing some new animals, right? I mean, evolution is not about extinction of everything. Why does, why, does, why does evolution need this special protection to protect the animals if we're just in a natural thing of evolving? And, and you know, DDT, why do we keep using DDT for? Just because it killed out all the bluebirds and everything. You know, big deal, so what? I mean, you know, survival of the fittest, evolution. Bluebirds don't need to exist. If they can't eat DDT and live, too bad, you know? So we banned DDT. And I'd agree with that one, incidentally. I like bluebirds. But not from a philosophical, religious ideal, but from the fact we should uh, take care of what God has given us. Well, fossils of dinosaurs. Here's where we talked about it best. You only have 40% if you had a complete one. All else is guesswork. Now remember we talked about some previous guesswork. Remember we talked about they found that tooth which turned out to be a pig's tooth but meanwhile they had built an entire man, a Nebraska man from that pig's tooth. That's imagination. For a tooth they didn't even have 40%. They didn't even have 1%. And they built an entire man. So this is what he looks like. They even put the amount of hair he had on his body. How tall he was, everything. Monkey skulls, we talked about Found in China, they built an entire Peking man out of them until they found out their monkey skulls. Thigh bones of a man suffering from man's case of rickets. They built an entire Java man, missing link. These are, these are so-called missing links. Nebraska man, Peking man, Java man, Piltdown man. These are all missing links where they're still missing. They're all either hoaxes, frauds, or misinterpretation because of imagination. Guesswork, lower jawbone, of an ape that's filed down to look humanoid. They built an entire Piltdown man and kept him around for about 50 years until it was turned out that it was an actual fraud, an actual hoax. Another guy put the wrong head on a dinosaur skeleton and built a brontosaurus. Did you know there's no such thing as a brontosaurus? That's the most well-known dinosaur except for the T-Rex. And there's no such thing as a brontosaurus. There's never been one exist in the history of the earth, never will be, because the head of what they proposed to be the brontosaurus and the body of what they proposed to be from the brontosaurus were found several miles apart, a year apart, and this turned out to be the skeleton of already a no, another known dinosaur, and this head turned out to be the head that belonged on another dinosaur. So they took parts from two dinosaurs, found a year apart, several miles apart, and this guy says, oh man, we found a new missing link. 
and they called it Brontosaurus. That's the one that some of you people might uh, remember, a gasoline station called Sinclair, and their symbol was Dino the dinosaur, and that was a Brontosaurus. That's the Brontosaurus, big, long guy, you know, the big, long neck, head up here like that. And uh, so it just doesn't even exist. Well, let's look at these guys called paleontologists. Atheist, if he's an atheist paleontologist, he holds a secular worldview and he, he embraces evolution. And being an atheist, he hates God, he's anti-God, and he uh, debunks anything, that even smacks of any kind of religion or anything of that nature. And he will hold to his view regardless of the amount of evidence you give him contrary if you hold a, if you're a Christian paleontologist, you hold a Christian worldview of creationism. And there are very few Christian paleontologists. Very few Christian archaeologists. Very few Christian uh, biochemists. Very few, chemi very few Christian truck drivers. Very few Christian bricklayers. You see what I'm saying? There are very few Christians. It's not just in science. It's everywhere. The majority are not Christians. You even go to the clergy, pastors. Very few are Christians. Boy, that'll get me in trouble, won't it? Well, you look at everybody who calls himself a pastor. Jehovah Witness, Mormons, many, many others. They call themselves pastors. They're not Christians. Two ways of thinking. You can either believe in what man says, or you can believe the Bible. That's what God says, see? So that's, that's what it boils down to. And then, of course, what we have here is the secular and Christian views. And in the secular view, our sun will dim, all life forms cease. You see, that's, that's supposed to be what happened to the dinosaurs. A great big meteorite hit down the Yucatan Peninsula of Central America. You've probably seen this program. And it blew up so much debris in the air, it put so much dust in the air, it shut off the sunlight for several years, and all the dinosaurs just died. But what amazes me about that story is all, just the dinosaurs died. Well, why didn't everything else die? And if anything else could live, why couldn't the dinosaurs live? Well, that's forecast. Our sun will go dim and... All life forms cease. Christian, 2 Peter 3, 10, 13, day of the Lord will come. Heaven will pass away with, with uh, great noise. And uh, elements will melt with fervent heat. This also includes the earth, it says. But then later it will be new heaven and earth. Right here, you know, we talked about all those positive charges being held together by some kind of power. Jesus Christ, the power in Colossians 1, 17, 18, holds every atom together. And you know, we fooled around the atom and we knocked little pieces out of it. Just, just knock a little piece out of an atom and you wind up with a nuclear bomb. Can you imagine the kind of heat and the sound you will have if all the atoms fall apart at the same time? No wonder 2 Peter 3.10 says that when the Lord comes, the heavens will pass away with a great noise, the noise of, a new, of the entire earth and, and, and the whole creation disintegrating in one great big uh, hydrogen nuclear detonation, all the elements will melt. Gold, silver, mercury, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen will fall apart with fervent heat. See, the Bible actually is right on. There's no problem. I think I have one more here to show very quickly some of the problems. Unfossilized dinosaur bones, T-Rex teeth, Evidence of rapid, sudden, catastrophic process to form fossils is now accepted by evolutionists. All kinds of living fossils, no missing links. Wild ideals such as the dinosaurs are not missing. They evolved to birds and still with us. And that's exactly what it says in the Cincinnati Zoo. On a plaque as you go into the bird area, it says, if you wonder where all the dinosaurs went, here they are. They're birds. These are wild ideals. And these anomalies which cannot be explained, such as gold pots, gold chains and iron pots in coal seams and things of that nature. So you can see there's just a massive amounts of information available. We're not being told. 
The evolutionists are not honest. If they were honest, they would allow this information to be taught. You notice that I didn't really uh, speak about the Bible particularly today, did I? I could have left every reference to the Bible out and still given this same presentation based on truth. Why is that so intimidating to the evolutionists? Because in the back of their mind, they know we're talking about a creator. That's what bothers them. They do not want to be accountable to a creator God. Next week.